On Overdrive today, we bring you the BMW i4 road test, a quick ride in the Honda CB300F and bring you a special treat from Britain. Hello and welcome to Overdrive, I am Soini Dad. BMW has always been known to put driver's needs first, which is why we were very curious to find out whether the electric cars would also retain this aspect. Here's Tuhin with the first drive review of the BMW i4. Now, if you happen to be someone who likes cars and driving, then this rapid shift towards electrification looks quite bleak, right? But if there was one car maker who you could count on to keep delivering the thrills, even in this one-dimensional age, it would have to be BMW, right? That job rests on the BMW i4 for now. It's the first fully electric BMW sedan after all. The numbers look good. This i4 eDrive 40 is rear-wheel drive, makes 340 PS and 430 Nm and can do its claimed 0 to 100 kmph time of 5.7 seconds even in pouring rain. Pretty much the time-tested BMW Sport Sedan formula then. Now on the road we're happy to report that the situation is heartening. The i4 feels quite a bit like what it is exactly, a 4 series that happens to be electric. So yes, that typical 4-cylinder grumble or that quite lively power delivery that you would otherwise find in a BMW of this type isn't there. It's replaced by quite a monotonous but brisker EV torque delivery, that typically flat EV torque curve. But put it into sport mode and the throttle response is sharp enough to bring back some of that excitement. And of course the steering weighs up and the whole thing feels a touch more engaging then. And of course you know how when you put your foot down, a BMW always gives you the thrills with that in your seat action. That still continues with the i4. For more sedate driving, you have the Eco Pro and Comfort modes. The Comfort mode finds a nice middle ground. Performance is still sprightly and the steering light enough to not feel like a chore in traffic. Switching to Eco Pro is best kept for longer journeys, where you might need to conserve charge. The i4 feels a touch laboured here, but is still perfectly usable if you find yourself in heavy traffic or even on the highway. But we found it easiest to just leave the i4 in the braking mode in crowded conditions, especially since you don't get paddles to choose between the three levels of regen. In this B mode, the i4 can be driven with just one pedal, slowing down to a complete halt with just the electric motor. This harvests a significant amount of energy and makes life quite simple when you get used to it. That the experience is so close to what you might get from a 3 series isn't surprising. The i4 uses a heavily revised iteration of the CLAR architecture you'd find in most combustion engine BMWs. But the structure has been enhanced to handle the added weight of the EV with new torsion struts, shear panels and a front subframe. Even the suspension setup is unique here. There's not a whole lot to separate the i4 and 320LD in terms of creature comforts. Both get a panoramic sunroof, 3-zone climate control, powered front seats, acoustic glass and leather upholstery. But if you are looking for rear seat comfort and are driven around a lot, the Grand Limousine is the one to pick. It's got a 105mm longer wheelbase than the i4 and has 43mm more rear legroom than a standard 3 series. Now stepping into the i4 is somewhat of an event thanks to these frameless doors. You find them on most BMW coupes. But the real showstopper here is this new iDrive 8 system. It's this huge monolithic curved display and while it is intimidating at first, it's, you've got these vibrant graphics and these crisp colours. It's quite easy to get used to. It. It's got a phone-like layout with these many icons. And you also get physical redundancies here to sort of guide you through them. So while there are many sub-menus, they are quite easy to get used to. Now the i4's battery is quite slim. It's only about 110mm thick. Which means that that low committed driving position that you like in BMW sedans that has been carried over to an extent. You still sit a bit higher up, the floor is a bit higher and you still have that large steering wheel perfectly positioned in front of you. Now the disadvantage of carrying on from an IC architecture is that you don't get those wide open storage spaces that you so expect in an EV. So you still have this wide center console, you still have regular sized door pockets and the floor is still quite high. So 
space management isn't quite what you would expect in an EV. But since everything has been carried over from the IC engine BMWs, you get that same level, that very high level of fit, finish and quality. So in that way, the 70 lakhs that you spend on this feel well worth it. The i4 is best used as a four-seater. There's more headroom than the sloping roofline suggests, especially if you're of average height. But the marginally higher floor does eat into underthigh support for rear passengers. There's also a large central tunnel that will make life difficult for the third passenger. Boot space is a useful 470 liters, especially with the large hatch and the folding second row. But with the motor at the rear, there is no spare wheel, a significant drawback considering our road conditions. Now another great trait of the i4 is its ride comfort. Even with these 19-inch M Sport wheels, the i4 will handle most of our road imperfections quite competently. Of course, it's got that typically stiff EV suspension, so there is some pitching and bobbing, especially at low speeds. But that fades away as speeds build. And then the i4 just seems to glide over quite confidently pretty much everything that you can throw at it, as long as they're not too large speed breakers or potholes, because it only has 125 mm of ground clearance and of course not that much suspension travel. So you have to be careful over those. But other than that, it's a calming, comforting experience pretty much however you drive it. And then when you want to get feisty behind the wheel, the i4 still delivers. Of course, it can't quite hide its two-ton curb weight. It's an EV with a large battery pack. But throw it into a corner and you realize that that poise and balance that you expect in a BMW sedan, in the way it feels so confident, that's still present. And there is some sensation to it as well, unlike many other EVs. So you'll find that the i4 will sort of switch and squirm underneath you, but it will still stay true to its line. So that's quite exciting. But hold on a second, because for a few lakhs more than the i4, about four or five lakhs, you can get yourself into one of these, a 530i M Sport, which is a proper old school BMW. To start with, it's a bigger car than the i4 and the 3 Series. You will look at the 530i for the sheer driving pleasure it offers. To start with, that two liter petrol is fizzy, it's vibrant, it's got great alert power delivery. And then with the adaptive chassis that this has, the adaptive dampers, the car just stays poised and glides over the road, whether you're, you know, going across a set of bends or you're just on a nice highway cruise. It just feels composed and rock steady all the time. Either way, the BMW i4 should interest you even if you aren't an especially enthusiastic driver. Its WLTP range is 590 kilometers, and in the real world, the i4 does better than most EVs we've driven so far in getting close to these numbers. We managed a city range figure of 495 kilometers, which was largely down to the quite effective B mode. The system recruits a significant amount of energy and the power unit too seems efficient in general. The addition of a heat pump also adds to this impressive range figure. Equally impressive is the i4's efficiency on the highway. We managed 472 kilometers of highway range. It's only a slight dip, probably down to the commendable 0.24 coefficient of drag. A useful addition is the charging features integrated into the iDrive system. It allows you to control not just preconditioning and set charging schedules, but will even let you control the current level and the cooling fans. Surprisingly, we think the BMW i4 is one of the better value BMWs you can buy right now. Yes, it could do with better practicality and maybe some more creature comforts. But for just under rupees 74 lakh on-road Mumbai, you get an EV with genuine long-distance ability that doesn't seem to come at the cost of driving character. It bodes well for the future. Yes, we actually have reached that point in time where if you have 70 to 80 lakhs to spare, then you can choose between BMW sedans that are either battery powered or naturally aspirated engines. We'll take a very quick break here on the show, but coming up on the other side, we'll acquaint you with a new naked street motorcycle from Honda. Stay with us, you're watching Overdrive. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. A third street naked motorcycle from Honda India is crowding the quarter litre portfolio. And here's Rohit telling you why you might want to take notice of the Honda CB300F. 
So essentially, the CB300F is another street naked that slots between the Hornet 2.0 and the CB300R. Unlike the Hornet 2.0 though, the CB300F has a more premium positioning and joins the CB300R at the Honda Big Wing dealerships, but undercuts the R by around 50,000 rupees on the X showroom price. You could call the CB300F a more aggressive and sportier looking alternative to the 300R and that too at a bargain. But apart from the name and the wheel and tyre sizes, there's nothing common between the 300 siblings. What the F uses in that sense is a completely new platform compared to the CB300R. Like for example, the engine is all new, it is not liquid cool, the chassis is all new, it is marginally heavier, the suspension is different but very similar in spec and hardware to the Hornet 2.0. With the sharp face and tank shrouds, the CB300F looks smart in my opinion and has the right amount of aggression without going overboard with the styling. And despite that Street Fighter stance, it's pretty comfortable too. The way the tail and the seat is designed, getting astride the motorcycle is not too difficult, both for the rider as well as for the pillion. And a 789mm seat height means that getting both your feet flat on the ground shouldn't be a problem for most average Indian heights. You do get a bit of a bucketed feel in the rider's seat and that's because of the large tank and the way the rear seat rises. But it's a nice secure feeling. I also like the way the knee recesses have been designed. So they give you a good grip of the tank despite this matte finish, both under braking and also while cornering. Again, pillion comfort is also going to be quite good. And the way the foot pegs are designed, the geometry for the pillion is also going to be quite comfortable even for those long distance journeys that we're talking about. Compared to the CB300R, the suspension setup is actually quite soft. Not just at the front, but also at the rear. And when you have a heavy pillion, it sags quite a bit. So adjusting that preload becomes very, very important. Thankfully, it is easily accessible. The suspension out on bad roads through potholes feels nice and soft. So that gives you a good supple ride quality. But astonishingly, around the bends, it doesn't translate into a squishy behavior from the motorcycle. It just goes through those bends with a nice authority. It feels nice and taut. And that long wheelbase, which is longer than the Hornet, the CB300R, the uh, CB200X as well, that long wheelbase really helps. It feels nice and stable through all the corners without really compromising on the flickable nature of the motorcycle. It isn't as sharp as something like a KTM Duke, but you will like the balance it achieves between sporty handling, highway manners and commuting comfort. The engine is all new. It has a larger displacement than the CB300R and isn't a bored out Hornet 2.0 engine. Unlike its sub 200cc counterpart, this one has four walls, which make it more efficient. Can the F fly? Well, the power output may not sound too convincing, but it is a fairly quick motorcycle. I love the crisp throttle response that it has to offer. I also love the refinement of the engine, especially for a single cylinder. More so if you compare it to the likes of the KTM Duke or the Bajaj Domina, this feels like a Honda. I also like the way it accelerates, I like the way it delivers torque. It feels much quicker, much stronger in the mid-range compared to most of the other Japanese 250s as well. Like the Honda CB350 Highness, the CB300F also features a traction control system, which is a good safety net to have in our conditions, even for a 20-odd PS motorcycle like this one. So yeah, it may sound a bit down on power and a bit high on the asking price, but then again, the Japanese reliability, the Honda refinement, the cost of Honda service, all of these are positive factors that will continue to work in the favour of this motorcycle. Well, the Honda CB300F does find itself in the midst of really tough competition given there is the KTM 250 Duke and also the BMW G310R. We will take a very short break but coming up on the other side we have a real treat, a British treat for you from Aston Martin. Stay with us, you're watching Overdrive.
Welcome back here with us on Overdrive. If you're a Formula One fan, then chances are you have feasted your eyes on the Aston Martin F1 Vantage safety car more than once this season. And Rohit was really excited to get his hands behind the wheels of one of these Aston Martin cars earlier this month when he visited Britain. Here's that story. Since time immemorial, it is believed that spotting a magpie brings bad luck. But if you spot a pair, it usually means joy or luck. Unfortunately, I didn't have a videographer with me, but on this very roof this morning, I spotted two of them. So it looks like it is my lucky day. I can't tell you because what I have with me here today is this. Say hello to the Aston Martin Vantage F1. Sure, it's not the V12 Vantage and has the humbler 4-litre V8 shared with AMG. But it's a great starting point. Though available in other colours, the signature shade for the Vantage F1 is green, inspired by the racing green Vantage safety car from Formula 1. The white you see here isn't too bad either. It's an Aston Martin after all and attracts attention anyway. Compared to the standard Vantage, the F1 safety car that you see on your television screens on most Sunday afternoons, it has significant changes or modifications to the suspension, to the aerodynamics to ensure that it can maintain a healthy pace while leading a pack of Formula 1 cars so that they can maintain their adequate tyre temperatures. Most of those modifications find their way on this F1 edition as well. The spring rates, compression and the bushing on the upper control arms of the suspension have been made stiffer to further reduce any vertical movement and make the car totter through the bends irrespective of where they are, road or track. The Pirelli P0 tyres, which usually are bespoke on such cars, run a different compound than the standard Vantage for better grip and performance with the stiffened suspension components. That said, Aston Martin is known to build some of the finest GT cars. So the suspension, despite having stiff, taut, firm as its keywords for its modifications, it still feels unbelievably supple. And the car changes direction just as sharply as you expect of a track-derived machine, even if it's derived from a safety car. Aston Martin makes beautiful looking cars, timeless designs, but at least to me they have often appeared hefty compared to their peers. Irrespective of what a certain Mr. Bond advertises, to me it's always seemed like Aston Martins would handle somewhere in between the sharp and focused European sports cars and the chunky American straight line heroes. I would always feel that Aston Martins might be somewhere in between that when it comes to the handling and the agility. I stand corrected. At least this, the Vantage V8 F1, feels nice and agile. It feels light on its feet. In fact, it feels just as light and lean as its new design tends to suggest. It feels articulated on the front and rear axle, not stepping out of line even when you're pushing it hard. How does a 7 minute 30 lap time around the ring sound to you? Quick, I would say and 15 seconds faster than the standard Vantage. With the new rear spoiler and the front splitter, it has 60 kilos of downforce up front and 150 kilos at the rear, up from a very road car-like 40 kilo rear downforce on the standard Vantage. 150 kilos of downforce. I wonder what that feels like. Of course, I would ideally want to be on a racetrack to experience those kind of numbers. That would be the ideal setting for a car of this order. But within the limitations of the road, the Vantage feels like a beautiful mix between a GT car and a track tool without feeling too focused on the latter. So I think it's safe to say that this car can keep everyone from a certain Mr. Burn, Mylander to a Rohit Paradkar happy. About Mr. Bond, well, I'm not too sure. Unless Mr. Bond is going to feel content with creature comforts like a chilly air conditioning system, a wired Apple CarPlay and a jog dial from a Mercedes-Benz C-Class to control the infotainment. There are no touch screens, barrels, bullets or smoke machines in here. The car can go from 0 to 100 in under 4 seconds. 
but it's not just about these numbers it's also about the oral drama with it the V8 engine we've sampled this in the AMGs in the past but in this package with this kind of a beautiful bodywork and with Aston Martin's engineering touch to it it just sounds so different of course it sounds brilliant it sounds beautiful even in the AMGs but here the soundtrack is slightly different and it's really enjoyable so simply put despite the F1 badging and the racetrack pedigree all this power that is channeled through calm yet precise mechanical components just makes this car such a joyous experience much like Aston Martin's own designs right they've proved over the years that power doesn't need to necessarily come in an aggressive shouty package to be made enjoyable it can be a rolling masterpiece and still be a joy to drive With that, we've run out of time on this week's edition of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube. And you can follow our latest updates on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Until then, drive and ride safe.